thank you so much for that incredible introduction. I uh, really appreciate that, Ms. Randolph. And the time that we've been able to spend catching up on the phone and just chatting um, was, was incredible. And again, it's your association. It's one of the most beautiful things about this business is not the money that you make, but the friends that you make, the associations, what you learn along the way. The difference between who you are today and five years from now are number one, the books that you read, and number two, the people that you associate with, and of course, Cat Roll Tide. Uh, so if anybody puts Roll Tide in the chat, <laughs> and will stop whatever I'm doing to respond to that. Uh, that that's pretty important. So uh, I, I really do appreciate that though, guys. And, and let me just tell you, success does not make excuses. You can make excuses or you can make money, but you can't make both. And I'll be completely honest with you guys, I've been nursing somewhat of a, a, a some drainage and some sore throat, the sinus thing over the last couple of days. And like, I didn't want to speak for an hour today. Uh, but the reality of it is you do what you don't want to do when you don't want to do it so that you can have what you want whenever you want it with whomever you want for as long as you want. Most people, like I guarantee you there's people right now this morning that are feeling similar to what I'm feeling. And I'm doing two back-to-backs today. I got this one and then another one, right? But there's people that are feeling the exact same way I'm feeling right now that didn't even turn on their camera and jump on the Zoom. They're like, I'm not feeling that great today. I think I'm gonna skip the Super Saturday and they're watching Netflix, right? So first of all, kudos to you for, for being here, first of all. Second of all, I wanna say that titles are temporary and things change, right? So I appreciate you know, silver executive director. Currently right now we're qualified as bronze. You know, we're, we're not at the silver position and that's okay, that's transparency because titles change, it doesn't matter. It, what doesn't change is your effort, your energy, your principles, right? Those don't change. Effort, energy, and principles, those don't change. Titles do. So I, I tell you that today, you know, some people are like, oh my God, he fell back from silver. Why would he tell that? Because there's probably people on this call today that are directors that were executive director at some point last year. There's probably people on this call that are senior directors that were executive directors last year. There are probably people on this call that were bronze, silver, gold, maybe even at one point in time, platinum that are ED or bronze right now. And it does not matter. The, 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 the title and legal shield does not matter at all but the principles of what I'm gonna share with you will make all the difference. So I'm not gonna train you on every facet of Legal Shield today. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna be very, very specific on what I train you on. You can learn anything from anybody. And you know, there's nothing I hate more than a trainer that tries to cover everything an inch deep. They go a mile wide and an inch deep. And that's not what we're doing today. We're going a mile deep and an inch wide, right? So it's gonna be very, very specific. We're gonna talk about building your power team. Now, for most of you, that's your entire organization. What is your power team? That is your organization, not under another executive director. So for example, let's say that Jason is an executive director on my team, or differently, I'm an executive director on his team. Anything that my team does, he can't count. So it's everything outside of his executive director leg. So if you're on this line today, and you don't have an executive director on your team, congratulations, you can count your entire organization in your power team. I see that, that, uh, that we've got some folks on here that I recognize that are executive directors, right? So it's, it's from your team down, your upline ED, right? Can't count your production. So how do you take that team specifically and grow it? Well, there's one goal, one goal you should have in growing your power team. One goal only, double digit recruiting. That was our only goal, get to 10 recruits. So what that looked like in November, December of 2019, I'll go back to 2019, that is um, over a year ago, right? That's fall of 2019. So we were doing about 13, uh, 10 to 13 recruits. I mean, there was one month we almost didn't hit 10. So our recruiting numbers were not that great. Volume was fine. We qualified ED every month, you know, uh, 1,500, 2,000 in volume. Now we did cut it close a couple of those months, 
but it was December. I had a conversation with a gentleman by the name of Aaron Browning. I don't know if anybody knows who that is. $300,000 ring earner, amazing gentleman. And he goes, Alex, you've got to start using more Zooms. You've got to start doing PZCs, private Zoom calls to launch your people. And I'm like, okay. So we had that conversation and I'll, I'll dig deeper into that later, but that's not yet. And so I started doing Zooms before Zooms were sexy, before everybody did everything on a Zoom. Like we still did Super Saturdays when I was doing Zooms, all right? Like in person. So in December, we, we, we hit 17 power team recruits using th these principles and things that I'm going to share with you, not only Zooms, but everything that I'm going to share with you. In January, we went to 25 power team recruits. In, in February, we went to 50. March, we went to 67. April of 2020, we were over 100 power team recruits. Now, our power team numbers are, are, are significantly lower today because we've broken more executive directors, so they don't count for our power team production. So I'm at a point right now, my power team is back to around 15 a month. Again today, you say, Alex, how did it go back to 15 a month? It's because when you create success and you create executive directors, you can't count them in your power team anymore. So I'm redoing everything. What I'm telling you right now is what I'm currently doing again to ramp our power team numbers up. Uh, we crested our best month. We did about $8,000, uh, not in commissions, but in premium. Uh, our best month last year was about $8,000 in premium. We've averaged uh, about five or 6,000 in premium. Uh, we dropped a little bit below that now. I think we're at three or 4,000 a month in premium. And so doing this is something that doesn't happen once. I'm sharing, being transparent with you guys to let you know, and I'm going to share my mistakes along the way as well, because this is not what's just currently happening. I've, I've been through a year of this. So I can share with you how it, I thought it was going to work and then how it actually worked and what I'm going to do differently this time around. So number one in, in building a double digit recruiting team, what does double digits mean? If, if Letitia was on my team, right? She's in one of two phases. She is currently qualifying for builder bonuses and as a double digit recruiter, or she is training to qualify for double digit recruiting and builder bonuses. So you're only in one, two, one of two categories. So Lisa, if you're not at double digits yet, then you're either in training to qualify for a builder bonus, right? Because you can't be eligible unless you're doing double digit recruitings or you're currently qualifying. So that's how I talk to everybody on my team. So, so if Allison was a brand new recruit on my team, what's up, Allison? Good to see you. Then, and she was brand new. I'm talking about like associate. I say, hey, Allison, we, we want to get you fast start qualifying to our core rank of manager, right? That was our only goal. I did not talk to Allison about double digit recruiting until we got her to the manager position. That was the core rank. Once she was a manager, we started talking about double digit recruiting. So I talked about double digit recruiting to managers and above because I don't need to confuse them with double digit recruiting if they're not a manager yet. Once they're a manager, they have a little bit of structure. They've made about a thousand dollars. Now they can see the vision. And then what I would do is I would take them from there and help them develop double digit recruiting teams. So now let me break it back down because that's the whole thing. Like that literally is the whole thing. You find somebody, they're either in training or working or double digit recruiters. We help them get to manager. Once they get to manager, we focus on double digit recruiting. Then once they hit it, we establish people on their team that can do it. And that was the whole platform. So now let me dig in. Our most important part was the welcome call. So uh, y'all know, know what welcome calls are. I'm gonna go through the six step welcome call, but I, I wanna know why in the chat, I want you to put in the chat why you think a welcome call is so important. And I wanna see if anybody gets the answer right because there's only one answer. Validation? Nope. That's a good one, but nope. Nope. I'm not seeing it yet. And these are all good answers. Third party? Nope. Says the tone? Nope. Edification? Nope. Activities? Nope. Come on, guys. Engagement? Nope. And these are all good answers. I'm still not seeing it. I'm still not seeing it. Uh, that one was close. 
Oh, come on. I'm gonna give you all another like 30 seconds. Somebody's got to get this right. This, this is why y'all aren't nailing it. Nobody's giving me the answer. Uh-uh. I'm still looking. Hey, who put that? Hold on. Who put that? I saw it. I saw it. Hold on. I saw it. All right, Brian Carruthers. Latuan Hall. Change your name. You cheating. You change your name. I'm, I'm going to change your name right now. Latuan Hall. He's cheating over there under Brian Carruthers' name, trying to give me the answer. He, he got the answer. All right. So nobody got the answer except the person that had 50 power team recruits within my organization last year. Uh, he's cheating because he already knows the answer because I we, we talked about this. So the answer, why you do welcome calls, there's one reason you do a welcome call, the main reason. All the other reasons you gave me were great supporting reasons. Here's the number one reason you do welcome calls, to identify talent. That is the main reason you do a welcome call, to identify talent. Yep, that's it. Daniel Smith, you got it. That is the number one. And it's not number one by a little bit. It's like, yeah, welcome calls are good for edification. Show them the team, show them support, third party. Those are a far cry from identifying talent. Like number one by a mile is to identify talent. Do you think if a Scott Scantlin joined your team that as a leader, as a talented leader, you would want to know who he is and lock arms with him towards the beginning? Or maybe if his upline was not, um, very assertive, maybe was not very, I don't want to say the word dominant in a bad way, but let's be real. If you don't have a sense of posture, you can't lead somebody like a Scott Scantlin, like a Letitia Randolph, right? They need somebody to say, hey, this is what you got to do. And Scott knows that because he worked with Dave Savula, who had the most posture, the most skill, the biggest team in all of Legal Shield. I guarantee you, if Scott wouldn't have been connected with some of those people, and there's probably others in the story, right? That I'm not aware of, maybe that not aren't even around today. I don't know. But if he wouldn't have gotten connected with Dave Savula at some point, he probably wouldn't be here today. That'd be my guess. He's shaking his head. So that affirms that. So the welcome call is designed to identify talent. What if there are people right now in your organization that joined in 2020 that are massively talented, but you never even talked to them? Now you say, Alex, five people joined my team in 2020. I talked to all of them. Okay, all right, I get it, right? Uh, almost a thousand people joined our team in 2020. And I am still anxious that there are people in those thousand that I haven't talked to yet that are rock stars. Somehow, maybe a welcome call wasn't done and I haven't seen them because they didn't produce. So the number one thing that you want to do by far with a brand new recruit is a welcome call. And the number one reason is to identify talent. You say, Alex, you said this for like five minutes, because if you miss this, none of the other training makes makes it worthwhile. This this is the money that the whole entire training could stop on. Well, seriously. So now let me go over why, what the six step process to identifying talent. Number one. Letitia, tell me your 15 second story. Now, why do I ask her to tell me her 15 second story? Now, this is I'm not I don't really I mean, she could tell me her story, but I'm asking this is number one in the welcome call, right? Why do I ask that? Because I don't want, I, don't, I love you, Letitia, but I don't want to hear whole, whole life story on my welcome call, right? Y'all know people, you get on a welcome call with somebody and they will not stop. You're eight minutes in and they're still talking. I don't have time for that. Like personally, if you have time for that, then you're killing your team. If you have time for that, listen to my words, you are killing your team. Because if you're spending 25 minutes, 30 minutes on a welcome call with somebody, you will never grow a large team. It's too much time. The, you, when you get on the phone with Scott Scantlin and you spend 25 minutes with him, he's like, holy crap, I cannot do this part time. I just spent 25 minutes on that call. I don't want to take Letitia's call again. When she calls me next time, I ain't got 25 minutes to spend on the phone. I'm going to send her to voicemail and text her back. So respect their time, even if you have it. Hey, Letitia, tell me your 15 second story. So she does. Number two, you share your story. Now your story can be between 30 and 60 seconds. It doesn't have to be 15. It can be encompassing. But if your story takes five minutes, again, you're doing it wrong. Your story needs to be no more than 60 seconds, right? And I will teach you how to craft a good story momentarily. Number three, your team story. Number three is your team story. 
And so you say, well, Alex, I don't have a team story. I'm a manager. Yeah, you do. Who's your upline executive director? If you don't know, right, first of all, find them and say, hey, what's our team story? How's our team done? Now, I tell my team, look, use our story. Like our organization, my team ranks in the top 10 in all of Legal Shield, not once, not twice, but for the last seven years in a row. Like in a row. I said, that's your team story. You use that story. Our team, the one that we're a part of, our leadership ranks in the top 10 the last seven years in a row. That's a solid story, right? So for you, reach up to your executive director, reach up to your ring earner, reach up to your millionaire club member, say, what's our team story? So that you get good at sharing it again in about 60 seconds, right? Share your team story. Number four, why legal shield? Number four is why legal shield? So if I say, hey, Ms. Perkins, why legal shield? And her response to me is, oh, I don't know. Letitia kept calling me. And she told me I need to sign up for this thing. And she promised me she stopped bugging me if I enrolled. I mean, reasonable, reasonable. Is that a strong why legal shield story? No, I'm not seeing a whole lot of talent at this point. No offense, Ms. Perkins. I just have to use somebody as an example. I saw you here. But here, here's a different story. If Ms. Perkins said, you know, when I was growing up, I was raised by a single mom. And we lost everything. And I could only imagine if we would have had legal shield that I would have been able to have my own room, my own bedroom growing up. Things would have been different. I may have went to a different school. I would have had different opportunities. We wouldn't have had to struggle so much. So why legal shield? So no other little girl has to deal with that. I mean, it's a fake story and the hairs on my arm are going up. That's how crazy emotion is. You could tell a fake story and make yourself get chills. Maybe you can't, but I can. Anyway, <laughs> so how crazy is that? Now I'm like, oh, I'm putting a star by this Miss Perkins lady. I'm like, that's a crazy story. Like that's that's got some good stuff right there. She may have some potential. Number five, Miss Perkins, what do you need to make a month for Legal Shield to be a win for you? What do you need to make a month for Legal Shield to be a win for you? She goes, oh, if I can make an extra $300 a month, this would be a game changer. Now, is that a wrong answer? No, it's her $300 a month. Now, it's going to be relatively easy to help her get to $300 a month. All she has to do is get in Performance Club. So I know that Performance Club is her goal, right? Nothing wrong with that. She, she's not on my list of rock stars immediately from a $300 a month. But that doesn't discount her. I mean, think about if you had 10 people making $300 a month on your team. That's 10 people in performance club every single month. You're pushing executive director. So never discount somebody that tells you two, $300 a month. However, if she says, Alex, I need to be at $10,000 a month, like minimum. Okay. That's somebody that I can run with that allows me to see a bigger vision, right? They say 10 grand a month. I'm like, she wants to go executive director. And I'd say, Hey, Ms. Perkins, that's awesome. You know, that's our executive director position. We can absolutely get you there, right? So now I've identified her. She's got a strong why. She wants to make good money. She's looking like she's going to be it. Now, number six is the determining factor. Number six, set a time for the private Zoom call. So Ms. Perkins, based on what you've told me, that you want to make an extra $10,000 a month with Legal Shield, we need to host a private Zoom for you where you invite friends, family, people that know, like, and trust you onto a Zoom. You do the invitation, I'll do the presentation. All you have to do is get people to show up. How many people do you think you can get to show up tonight at seven o'clock? Notice I said tonight at seven. It's 11 a.m., at least in my time zone, Central. I think y'all are in Central too. It's 11 a.m. I mean, does she need till next weekend to host a private Zoom call? For $300 a month, maybe, but not for $10,000. You said, but for $10,000, wouldn't she need more time? No. Have you all ever heard the saying, if you give a man enough rope, he'll hang himself? I think that's an old one. My dad always told me that, though. He's old. He just turned 70 yesterday. So if you give a man enough rope, he'll hang himself. I mean, if I tell Miss Perkins that we'll do it five days from now, next weekend, next Saturday, I said, okay, next Saturday, when do you think she's going to start inviting to that Zoom? Friday of next week, right? You act like you just procrastinated in school and let me call you a liar, 
we, we procrastinate our whole lives. If there's a, like, I got a deadline on here to submit my story. I'm in a coaching program with Eric Worre and uh, it's called the Accelerator. We paid a whole bunch of money to be in there. And I got to submit my story to them to review by March 22nd. Do y'all know it's March 13th and I haven't even, I haven't even done that yet. You know what? I'm probably going to think more about doing that when it March 18th, 19th, 20th. That, so let's be real. Miss Perkins doesn't need a week. I say, Miss Perkins, how many can you get tonight? She goes, oh, tonight? Well, tonight, uh, that's a little soon. Probably five, maybe just five or 10. So that's great. Five or 10 tonight, seven o'clock central. And then I'm going to send her the, the videos that we use. Everybody's got launch videos, right? So you don't need my videos. You've got launch videos. Your team has launch videos. I do have a text message that I like using that I'll share with you guys and I'll send it to Mr. Scantlin and he can send it out in an email if he'd like to. Um, let me look that up real quick. And the reason I send Miss Perkins a text message is because she may not have the vernacular to invite people. And I don't want her fear of the phone to prevent her from making those invitations. So I send all my associates this launch text and I'll say, hey, Miss Perkins, if you wanna change this up in any way, please do. Um, I want it to sound like it's coming from you, not me. This is just a guideline. So it says, hey, name of guest. So, hey, Scott, I've got just a minute. I'm involved in an exciting project with a former VP of Microsoft, Jeff, Microsoft, Jeff Bell, who launched Halo and Xbox Live. We are working to launch a couple of new smartphone apps, and I wanted you to hear about it. If I invited you to a special invitation-only webinar, would you hop on Miss Perkins? Right, so I'll send that. I'm going to text it to him right now so he can... If he wants to put in a slideshow before the end of uh, the event, he can. Um, and, and and that's not that's not foolproof. It doesn't mean we get you know 100 people on each Zoom, but it allows somebody like Miss Perkins to say, well, I don't know if I feel like making the calls today, but you know what? I'll send out those text messages. Not saying Miss Perkins. I know you said you can have five to ten people on. You may want to reach out to those personally, but here's a text message if you want to invite some additional people. You can send this text message out to 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 people, 100 people on your phone. I don't care, right? Whoever responds, they can make it tonight. Because the text is simple for her to send. There is zero, nobody's scared to send a text, right? All right, so set time and date for PZC, preferably today. But here's the cool part. If I say today and Ms. Perkins says, oh, I can't do it today, how about tomorrow? That's generally the counter, right? That's generally the counter. Wouldn't it be, isn't it easier for her to say, how about tomorrow versus what about next week? So that's why I move with urgency for today so that she can counter if she needs to with tomorrow. So that is the six steps for a welcome call to identify talent and book them into activity. Number two, well, it's the next section, I'm, I'm a section kind of guy, I'm like, I got OCD, is PZC within 24 hours. So with a, a PZC, you know, you want to track, I'm not going to go over the, all the how to's of a PZC because there's ton of training on that. Uh, however, what I do want to go over is some things that folks don't talk about. So what are the number of Zooms? I call them, I call them Zooms, PZC Zooms. How many Zooms are happening per day and per week in your organization? I want you to write that down per day and per week on your team. So if Dennis says the number is zero, we've identified very easily where Dennis needs to improve, right? No offense, Dennis, I just picked you because you're on the front screen, right? So, so it says internet connection's unstable. Hopefully that's stable here momentarily. All right, so that, we're good to go. Okay, cool. Good, all right. So you, you wanna go with, so what's that number? Is that number one? Is that number three? The, the goal, the goal, what you want to get to weekly to, to get into double digit recruiting. You don't have to keep this in a, in a plane, right? You, you put the throttle down 100% to get off the runway, right? So you don't have to keep this rhythm going to maintain double digit recruiting forever. But if you're not in double digit recruiting, let me give you your averages to get there. 10 to 20 a week. 10 to 20 a week. So if you're not, if your team within your organization is not doing 10 to 20 Zooms a week, that's about two a day, right? A little bit less to get to the 10, 20, right? It's about two, three a day. That's where you need to be at. Um, and then the next question is, how many Zooms are happening with the leaders on my team? So if Letitia is teaching me to be a double-digit recruiter, 
then she doesn't need to know just how many are on her team. Alex, how many Zooms this week are on your team? That's a question she can ask me to take somebody that she's identified with talent and see where they're going. Because if the answer is zero, I'm not getting a double digit recruiting this month, period. If the answer is three, it's better than zero. Well, one's better than zero. But she knows that I need to get up to that 10 Zooms a week at minimum to know that she can look at me as a double. So a lot of people talk about the how to's, but they don't talk about the numbers behind it. What are the numbers that you need to be shooting for? Uh, one of the mistakes that I made with this is I was doing on average two to four Zooms a day personally. It took, I mean, I'm talking about my, my, the way my throat feels right now. That was pretty much every day, every day. I mean, I was exhausted. I would do back-to-back -back Zooms. I'd book one at six, then 6.30, then seven, then 7.30, then eight. I did, I did 20 to 25 minute Zooms. I'd wish everyone well, tell them the host is gonna get back to them and to set up a call with me. I'm on to the next Zoom. Like I would spend two hours sometimes a day just on Zooms. Like two to three hours sometimes Zooming. Like not prospecting, not following up, not talking to my team, not training, actual income producing Zooms. That, it was insane. That's a lot of work. Here's my mistake. I didn't develop a lot of new presenters. That's like my 2021 catch that if I do this and a Zoom is happening on Letitia's team, this is, this is 2.0. This is not 1.0. This is not what I did last year. This is my correction. I would not schedule a Zoom on Letitia's team, period, unless she was present. If she can't make it, I'm not doing it. Now, there is an exception. If I need the production from this leg to hit a rank personally, I'll make that exception once or twice. There's always an exception to every rule. Rules are meant to be broken, right? Always an exception. But if I'm training Letitia to be a double-digit recruiter, why am I doing work in her organization where she's not learning? It's a waste of my time. And then more importantly, I'm going to let her know the expectations. Hey, Letitia, I'd be happy to do five to ten of these Zooms for you. But by the 10th one, I expect for you to be doing it. So I'll do three or four. I'll let you do the introduction. I'll do another couple. I'll let you do half of it. By the 10th one, I'm going to watch you do it. And I'll give you some feedback. Because if I would have done that last year, holy moly, I'd have like 20 people presenting. Can you imagine? I mean, how many people on your team right now? Ask yourself this as a number. How many people on your team right now can present? I'm talking about share their story and start to finish. Present a presentation, like a good one. Yeah, drop it in the chat. I'm seeing some zeros. No worries. You're here today, so that'll change. Two to three. Zeros, no worry. Five. Love it. One. That's real. On my team, right? I'm a $200,000 ring earner. I think there's seven, like five to seven tops, tops. And that may, that may be people that are able to present, but are not even presenting. Like they're not actively building right now. So does that even really count? I mean, there's probably three that are actively building that can present that, that excuse me, are presenting not can present. I've got five to seven that can, probably three, maybe four are. That's another number you need to watch. So these numbers that I'm giving you, these should go like on the whiteboard. You see my whiteboard right there? You don't have to have one that takes up the whole wall like I do, but like that should be on your whiteboard. On your whiteboard should be like Zooms a day, Zooms a week, leaders Zooms, right? And track their numbers. That should go on your whiteboard. Another thing is presenters. That should go on your whiteboard. How many presenters do you have? Um, and, and the expectation would be, hey, Allison, I'll do these Zooms with you and for you. But by doing these Zooms and getting to 10 Zooms a month, or excuse me, 10 Zooms a week within your team, you're going to be an executive director in the next 90 days. At the executive, executive director position, I would expect that you're doing all your Zooms. I had EDs on my team 
making five to $8,000 a month and I was doing their Zooms at the executive director position. That was a massive mistake. That is the reason they are not executive directors today. And they were frustrated and put out by Legal Shield because their money went away when really it was my fault as a leader for not telling them you should expect to present. I mean, how many times do you expect your upline executive director to do presentations for you if you're making five to $10,000 a month? Don't you think at that level of income that you would be expected to produce at that level of income, which means that you need to be a presenter. And so guys, if you're new on this Zoom, I, I, I don't want to overwhelm you, right? I am talking to people currently that want to make five to 10 grand a month. And here's how you can participate if you don't care to make five or 10 grand a month. Talk to your upline that does and let them know you're committed to hosting some Zooms they can present, right? So you're not out of the equation. You know, if, if, if Latuan says, I don't want to make five to 10 grand a month, but I'd love to be able to make a couple hundred to a thousand a month, then I'm going to say, hey, no worries, brother. Who can we get? I'll do, is, I'll do a couple Zooms for you every week. You can be one of the 10 Zooms I do this week. So those people don't feel like you're out, reach out to your upline because you could participate in helping them become executive directors by hosting the Zooms. And you know what? By hosting the Zooms, you're probably going to find somebody on your team that wants to get to five or 10 grand a month that follows this structure. All right, next, next, uh, next subject. Right. And by the way, if you want to learn how to get good at doing private Zoom calls, host one. Reach out to your upline executive director. You say, Alex, I don't know how to do a private Zoom. I hadn't done one or I'm not familiar with it. Or I hadn't done one in forever. Reach out to your ED, your ring earner, and say, I need to host a private Zoom. It's been too long since I've had one. I want to see how this works. They'll coach you. They'll point you to the training. They'll make sure that you know how to do it, right? That's not what today's about. There's plenty of training out there. I'm digging down into the numbers and stuff. All right, next section, core rank, core rank. So this is one of the first things that we focused on with a new associate is the core rank. By uh, sh drop in the chat what the core rank is in Legal Shield. What's the core rank? Four people know what the core rank is. Five people, six people. Congratulations to the seven people that know what the core rank is. <laughs> I'm just messing with you guys. All right, good stuff. It is 100% manager. So that's good, that's good. So what do you need to become a manager, right? You need three recruits and $400 in premium. That's it, three recruits and $400 in premium. Said differently, that's basically three recruits and eight combination plans. Anybody gets a combination plan, eight of those, combination, legal shield, ID shield, you throw in the home business supplement, you're there. So that's what I would teach people. I'd say, hey, Katina, this is what we need to do. Our goal is to get, I didn't even really talk about fast start qualification. That's such a low bar. I mean, what, she needs to get two sales and one recruit? Why are we talking about that? Like, I mean, back in the day, I know Scott Scantlin can share, like it was like three and five or something just to qualify or something like that. I don't know what it was, it, what, and it, it doesn't matter. But I would talk about three and eight. Katina, we need to get three recruits and eight memberships. So we were building for that. When she would have a Zoom and she would recruit one person and sell three memberships. Hey, that's awesome. We're so much closer. All we need is two more recruits and three and four, what it, four five. Six, seven, eight, five more memberships. I suck at math. I'm a math magician, not a mathematician. So that's why my teacher lied to me when I was a kid. She said, you're not gonna always have a calculator. Bet, I have a calculator. I don't need to add. So <laughs> anyway, uh, I just focus on like, don't, don't catch me on Jeopardy. I don't know all that stuff. That's for somebody else. I got Google, right? And I need to keep in my mind what matters to me. That's three recruits and eight memberships, eight combo plans. So now let me ask you a question. How many managers do you need to get to director? Drop it in the comments. How many managers do you need to get to director? I love it. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. Keep it coming. 
All right. That's good stuff. I can see by your answers, most of you are confused. If you said the answer is three, you are wrong. The answer is seven. Seven. That's right. That's it. Seven managers to get to director. Now, some of you have been in the business for a couple of days, weeks, or a couple of months, and you're like, damn, they didn't tell me it was seven. I thought it was three the whole time. <laughs> well, technically, it's three in separate legs. But what is three times four? That's 1,200. How much, how much premium do you need to get to director? 2,700. So where in the world does three managers equal $2,700? It doesn't. So if I'm working with Kat, we're not talking about three managers. Say, so Kat, congratulations on getting to the core rank. By the way, let me just pause. Anytime somebody hits the core rank, it's a celebration. I'm talking about we make a Facebook banner, we celebrate them, they speak on the team call, they do, they do a five-minute training on the team call, sharing beyond their story, things that help them do it. What you know, I mean, they're a rock star. Might as well hit executive director on my team when you hit the manager position. I mean, the whole month, I mean, we celebrate you by hitting that position. It's got to be the biggest position, excuse me, that anybody hits on your team manager. It is, it is the portal to everything. So I said, Kat, congratulations. Amazing. You're a rock star. I want you to speak on our team call on Wednesday. What, you know, tell me your story. Like, what did it mean to you to hit manager? How did you do it? And um, first of all, I'm doing a couple of things. I, I'm making sure I know what she did to do it. Like, was it legit? So as, as a leadership perspective, a, 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 I don't even know what the little thing is. The uh, astrophy or whatever. Anyway, you, you want to make sure that you're making sure that they're doing it right. If she goes, oh, I just told everybody to sign up. It was the easiest thing ever. Now, I'm not going to tell her what she was doing is, is wrong. I'm going to share in a positive way why she would want to do it differently moving forward, right? And we're going to make sure that those members stay on the books. That was another thing. I didn't always inspect what I expected. So we had people hit manager. I mean, we would have 10 people hit manager a month. That's a lot, right? I mean, for any of you, just think about the last time you had a new manager pop on your team. By the way, whiteboard, whiteboard. This is something that goes on your whiteboard. How many people are hitting manager a month or a week on your team? This is one of those whiteboard things. Take this away from the training, put it on your whiteboard. This is what you're tracking. And so I said, that's amazing. Cat, now we only have to help seven more people do the same, and you're at the top of the comp plan. Now, at, there's, still, there's still bonuses to get to the manager position. I would not call them matching bonuses because to match, they would have to match, right? So <laughs> I don't know what they call them today, but there are bonuses, right? When you go out and help your new recruit hit manager, they make 450, you make 150. Right. So this time last year, it was like 500 and 500. So it was a little bit, I mean, thousand dollars was being paid out. I was, that was pretty, that was a massive reason. So one of the other mistakes that I made is I focused too much on the bonus and not the commission and the celebration of the rank. Because when the company changed the bonus from 500, 500 to like 300, 100, or 450, 150, I mean, they changed it a couple of times. Some of the team that I had in momentum slowed down to a creeping halt because there was no longer a compelling reason for them to hit manager because we placed too much emphasis on the manager position. Ask Mr. Latuan Hall. <laughs> he'll, he'll tell you. So when we put that much emphasis on manager, somebody would, Cat would get to seven sales and three recruits. And she wouldn't get her, her eighth sale in on the 45th day. She got it in the 46th day. And then she's all like, oh, I can't wait to get my bonus. And the 500 never comes to her. And the 500 never comes to her sponsor, Letitia. Now they're both pissed off when really if they should have had it done in their first 45 days anyway. But we made it so much about the bonus that both of them likely quit. So that was my one thing that I would tell you guys that do not put as much emphasis on the bonus money is the fact that they're making 150 plus a pop at the manager position. At manager, when you refer one a week, like one a week, that's an extra 600 bucks a month. 
and commission, something they can control, something the company, the company is going to change bonus structure from here until kingdom come. It's a bonus. It's not the compensation, but the compensation has always gotten better ever since I've been involved for the last 10 years. Bonuses change all the time. So let me make sure I got all my stuff. Yes. So that's a, that you want to track how many managers are popping on your team and how you develop managers. You have a great welcome call. You set the private Zoom and then you focus on the core rank. All right. So let me talk real quick about your story, because now we're getting back to, you know, I'm going to I'm going to revisit some of these topics back to um, PZC, sharing your story, three way calls, things like that. How do you create a good story? Well, number one, and creating a good story. So the headline of this is your story. Number one is your background. Number one is your background. What did you do before Legal Shield? And if you got 18 backgrounds, just pick the one that you like most, right? I was a school teacher, a bus driver, a football coach. I uh, was in the bowling league and I got paid to do that a little bit. I was serving tables, doing a little bartending. And then, uh, <laughs> never mind, I was going to say some other stuff that I think is really funny, but probably not appropriate. All right, number two. <laughs> number two, what you didn't like. What did you not like? What was the problem? Like, what was in your life that was missing that you needed more of? What did you lack? What was the problem? Number three, the solution. Number three, what was the solution to that problem? And number four, how do you feel about the future? How do you feel about the future? So real quick recap. Number one, your background. What did you do? Number two, what did you not like? What was the problem? Number three, what is the solution? And number four, how do you feel about the future? All right, pop quiz. Which one of these do you think is the most important? Drop it in the chat. Like the most important part of your story. Is it the background, what you didn't like, the solution, or how you feel about the future? The problem, okay? Future. Ooh, I see a lot of people talking about the solution. Background, all right, both. Cool. The answer is the problem. And here's why. Because people relate to vulnerability. When you share your vulnerability, it draws people in. Here's the thing. If your story has one E in it, you will push people away. You'll repel people. If your story has two E's in it, you'll relate to people and pull them in. What do I mean? One E, ego. One E is ego. If your story is egocentrical, then you're not going to pull people in. You're actually going to not going to relate to them at all. Number two is two E's, everyone else everyone else. They need to be able to relate to your story. So you heard my story at the beginning of the Zoom. Let me share my old story with you guys. It'll be quick. Hey guys, Alex Sheehy, 23-year-old college kid. I was a server and a personal trainer. One of my training clients shared some information with me I thought was a game changer. It made so much sense. I figured it could make dollars. So I got started right away, made $3,600 my first month, $24,000 my first year. And today we make over $200,000 a year and I don't have to work a job for a boss. Never created a resume or took a job when I left school. That was my old story, which is pretty much like a lot of big E's in it. Like ego, 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 ego me, right? I'm an only child, so it came naturally and I'm really good at it. But I had to learn through this accelerator program that I did with Eric Worre that by the way, paid 10 thousand dollars to attend they spend an entire two days on your story i have note cards i encourage you to get note cards i love note cards maybe i'm weird but note cards are bomb.com as a matter of fact i put call lists on note cards like these are people that i have to call today the reason i put people on note cards this is totally an aside is because when i leave out of here two things number one i don't have a purse but i have a pocket and so i will take this note card put it in my pocket and go about my daily business. And when I got two minutes, I'll pull it out of my pocket and guess who I'm calling? The people on the note card. Y'all ever wonder who to call? Don't leave the night before you go to bed, like tonight, like after it's time to call people, like you're done calling people. It's eight o'clock, nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, 
grab a note card and write the people down you're going to call tomorrow. If you leave your house to go to church, uh, yeah, exactly. If, if you leave your house to go to church and, and you're like, who do I call? Pull out your note card after church, after you eat, whatever the case is. I love note cards. I do them every day. But in this case, I use note cards for my story. And so I saved every portion of my story that I've changed so far on these note cards. So I'm going to share my story now with you guys. Um, hey, guys, Alex Shahid. Um, I was a 23-year-old college student, and I was struggling. When I was growing up, I was picked on and made fun of, and I lacked a lot of self-confidence. And honestly, I figured getting a good degree and a good job and a great career would change that for me. It would give me the confidence that I was looking for. But I found myself anxious because I had no clarity of direction just a year away from graduation. I felt like I was having to settle just to take a job, just to pay the bills, which I was already doing to get through college. And I was starting to get depressed. And one of my friends approached me about a business project that he was working on, and I was open to taking a look. I took action immediately, and I'm so grateful for that because one year later, I was financially independent, and as I was graduating college, not only did I have a clear path and purpose for my life, but I never even had to create a resume or take a job, and today, I'm most proud of the fact that I didn't settle, that I didn't take the, the easy road. I took the path less traveled. And today I don't have to work for my first name and my bills. I get to work for my last name and my legacy. And today I've been able to retire my wife from her job. We travel all over with our kids, spend a month at the beach in October of this past year, because every day I share that story with others to help put them on a path to where they can achieve what's important for them and their lives. You'll see like the massive difference in those two stories. Like, massive difference. So I would encourage you guys to grab some note cards and, or, you know, do it on paper, whatever. I just like note cards. I'm biased and put number one background, like four different note cards. Number one background, number two, didn't like problem. Number three solution. Number four, feel about the future, write them out on four different note cards and then practice it. I challenge you to share your story with 10 people before next week. 10 people, and, and you'll get better at the story. As a matter of fact, here's what I did on one of my team calls. If y'all have team calls, this would be great. There are breakout rooms. Like I could hit breakout room and put everybody into a room. I was gonna do that today, but we just don't have enough time to make that happen on here. It takes about an hour uh, for, for, for us to do that with, with about 30 or 40 people on a Zoom. If you've got, for every 30 people, right, you may need to add some additional time, but here's how that would work. So team activity for you guys. Uh, you break everybody into breakout rooms and you say everybody has two minutes to share their story, two minutes. Immediately after Letitia shares her story, the timekeeper starts the two minutes over and it's feedback. So the five, the three, five, seven people in her breakout room are now giving her feedback on her story. Hey, Letitia, I love how you said this, but you mentioned how you never had time for your kids and in your solution, how you feel about the future. You talked about time and money freedom, but I never heard about your kids again. What do you get to do with your kids differently? Because that seemed to be the problem. I never heard about them in the solution. And she's like, oh, damn, I didn't put the kids in there. You know, okay, all right, all right. Now I get to take, pick my kids up from school every day and take them to the park. And they know mom instead of, you know, the babysitter. Boom, you know, I mean, that as simple as that. Could, if that was the problem, that needs to be in the solution. So you you can you'll pick. So you'll do that for everybody in the Zoom room. So if there's five people in there, right? Five times four is twenty minutes that you're going to be in the Zoom room. And then you'll come back in the main room, and and everybody picks a winner. Like you know, Letitia was a winner from her room. Jason was a winner from her room. Cat's the winner from her room. Lisa's a winner from her room. And I take those winners, and they did a speak off in front of the whole team. All right, all right, guys. We have these five winners, and I let them know ahead of time. I said, y'all are going to be doing a speak-off. And so we did a speak-off, and then the whole team voted on their story. And then from there, we actually had a tie last week. This coming Wednesday on our team call, we have a tiebreaker between two individuals, right, between two individuals. I'm going to be sending them a little prize for the winners. Nothing crazy, right, but just 
putting themselves out there. And I had more people on my team say, Alex, I've never known how to share my story before. And I'm so grateful that you did that exercise because that's the first time I ever shared my story. And so the more people that you can empower to share their story on the team, the more likelihood that you have for them to win. All right. That being said, reds, greens, and blues. Let me share this approach with you guys, and I'm going to wrap up with a video. So there are different personalities out there. There are different people out there, right? Reds, greens, and blues. Reds are people that you look up to. These are people like your parents. These are people like uh, the business owner. These are people like the mayor. These are people that are successful. They're the pastor, right? Physically, spiritually, monetarily successful. People that you look up to. So, so when you approach a red, it's a little bit different. You want to, number one, stroke their ego, and number two, ask them for a favor. So if, if Jamar was one of my prospects, I would reach out to her, and I would say, I probably wouldn't call her Jamar. I'd probably say, hey, Miss Curtin, hey, Miss Curtin, I just wanted to give you a call. You've been so successful with your company. I've seen how you've always taken your kids on trips every year. You always seem to be a present mom. And honestly, right now with my two kids, I feel like I'm not there for them the way I want to be. And I'm working on a project that I think could give me the type of time freedom with them that I want to achieve. And with all the success that you've had, I would love for you to kick the tires on this thing and tell me if you think it's a good idea. If I sent you a video on what I'm doing, would you take an honest look at it and, and give me your opinion from the filters of success that you've had? All I'm doing is building her up, stroking her ego and asking her to take a look. What are the odds do you think that she'll take a look? Pretty high, pretty high. Because two things I know about successful people, most successful people are pretty humble. Most successful people are pretty grateful. So Miss Curtin's making a couple hundred thousand, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars a year. She runs a multi-million dollar company. She drives the Jag, lives in the big house. If somebody that's one of her friends or, or acquaintances comes up and, and, and edifies her like that and asks for her help to look at something, the project they're working on, out of the goodness of her heart, she's typically going to say, if, you know, absolutely, if I can help you, for sure. Because she's achieved a pinnacle of success where she feels like she wants to reach back and help other people. They're the easiest people to approach. Reds are actually the easiest people to approach. Because your peers, greens, greens are your peers. They're, they're some of the most difficult people to approach, your peers. Here's why. That's where the land of rejection is with your peers. So Jamar hits up her friend, Miss Perkins. And she goes, hey, Miss Perkins, da, 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 da. you know, uh, I'm working on a project. And Miss Perkins says, what is it? You know, what is it this time? What are you doing now? You know, because they're friends. And so she gets immediate rebuttal from her because they grew up together, right? So here's how you approach the greens. You have to know why you're doing it. Here's what Ms. Perkins says. What is it? She does not actually mean what is it. She just doesn't know how to articulate what she actually means. Do you know when somebody asks you what is it, what they actually mean? Two things. Number one, why are you doing it? Number two, why are you talking to me about it? That's what they really want to know. Jason says, what is it? He just wants to know why you're doing it. Why are you asking him? That's, that's where his curiosity comes in. And so if you answer his curiosity before you ask him, you know, and, 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 and this is not uh, uh, Jamar's story at all, right? But again, just going back into this. She hits up Miss Perkins. She goes, hey, Miss Perkins, look, you know how um, my kids, we, we've been living in this apartment. My kids have been sharing the same room for a while. And, you know, my, my daughter... Is, is getting older now and, and she really has been wanting her own room. And every night she asked me when I put her to bed, mom, you get, am I getting my own room, right? You know, when, when are you getting, when are you helping me get my own room? We, we're getting that house this year, right? And, you know, honestly, I have to turn away because I get emotional because as a mom, not being able to do that for my kids just does something to me. And I know something's got to change. So a friend of mine introduced me to a project that I believe that by the end of this year, we could purchase that house. And Ms. Perkins, honestly, I need your help. If I sent you a video on this, would you take a look at it? 
it, it may or may not be for you, but you may know some of the people that I'm looking for and I'm determined to get my kids this house. Now, I don't care who Miss Perkins is. If she's a good person at all, she's looking at it. If your friends say no to that, they're bad people. Just like gone, bad people. You're like, you're telling me my friends are bad? Yes, they suck. If you approach them like that and they tell you no, that I don't even know why they're in your life, right? You literally just shared why you're doing what you're doing. And if they can't respect that, now if Miss Perkins says, what is it? That doesn't mean that she's evil. She may still ask the what is it question. But now Jamar can say, this is a house for my kids. This means the world to me. Now, if I send you this video that explains it all, would you just take a look at it? All right, fine. I'll take a look at it. Right? Because she explained why she's doing it and why she's asking me. She's doing it for her kids and she needs her help. All right. Blues. Blues are people that look up to you. These are people that look up to you. Here's how you approach a blue. Hey, cat, take a look at this video. This is something you should do. I'm going to send it to you. Watch it right now. You need to sign up for this. And you know what cat's probably going to do? She's probably going to sign up because you're you and you asked her to. Right. And then cat's going to reach out to John. John, watch this video. You need to look at this. You need to sign up for this. And John's probably going to sign up because Kat told her to, and Kat has influence, right? Here's the problem with that. It's kind of like recruiting the, the restaurant owner. The owner of the restaurant recruits the general manager. The general manager recruits the head bartender. The head bartender recruits the head server. The head server recruits the head bus boy. The head bus boy recruits the head dishwasher. Who's the head dishwasher going to recruit? His own mama don't even like him. Now what do you do? Right? Everybody's quitting because nobody else has anybody to talk to. What if you flip that around? Instead of going down, what if you go up for reds? Head dishwasher, head, uh, uh, head bus boy, head server, head bartender, general manager, business owner. Who's the business owner going to talk to? All his business owner friends. He's got a lot of people to talk to. Now the head dishwasher has doubled his monthly income. He's making more money in a week than he's making in a month because he's moving up. Now, is it wrong to approach somebody that needs an opportunity? No, but understand that your business will not duplicate when you do that because you're closing the socioeconomic gap. The sphere of influence is getting smaller versus as you're recruiting up and recruiting reds, the sphere of influence is getting bigger. So guys, using ultimately becoming a double digit recruiter, using the welcome calls to identify talent, explaining to people how to do a PZC, getting them good at their story, helping them hit the core rank, knowing the number of Zooms that are happening per day, per week in their organization. How many Zooms are happening in your leader's organization? Are you developing new presenters? How many managers are you breaking a month on your team? That's how we got the $200,000 rank. Everything I just gave you is the playbook. Everything else is stuff that we learned along the way. So if you still have question marks for any reason, keep studying, right? You probably have a weekly Zoom with your team. You need to be on it, right? Or this is what I teach my team. Very simple system. Two exposures a day, two weekly training calls, because we have one with Brian Carruthers with Team Pinnacle, and then we have our team call. So we have two training calls a week, two calls a week, one weekend a month, right? This is the one weekend, and then one, excuse me, one Saturday a month. This is the Saturday, right? One Saturday a month and then one weekend a year. That's the international convention. This year, it happens to be April 17th and 18th live stream. Let me repeat that. Very simple system. This is what we teach our team for continuing success. Two exposures a day, two weekly training calls, one Saturday a month, one weekend a year. It's as simple as that. All right. So before I close out, I want y'all to listen to this six minute video. We're going to go over just slightly but I think it's so powerful because people ask me all the time, um, why do you love Nick Saban so much? Like, what is it about this guy? Like Roll Tide, Nick Saban, national champions. Like, what is it that's so incredible about him? Y'all are like a cult. Well, here's a, a short seven minute snippet of a leadership talk that you can find on YouTube. You, you obviously see my screen. You can write that down, but just listen to this and tell me if this doesn't point your path 
to uh, your star due north? Is really more to the young people in the crowd. And I always get asked a question, probably more often than anything else. What does it take to win? Good game plan, good preparation, good system on offense and defense, ability to adapt and adjust during the game. But you know what my answer always is? It's mindset. It's how you think. It's the vision that you have for what you want to accomplish. You know, some people want to climb Mount Everest. That's their vision. Someone else like Michael Johnson would spend a thousand hours taking one tenth of a second off his 400 meter time so he could win two gold medals, the 200 and the 400, instead of one. But whatever your vision is, and you know, we have two sets of eyes. We have the eyes that see everything that happens, and we have the eyes of the soul, all right, which is really what's important to us, what we want to accomplish and what we want to do and what our vision is. And once you have that, then you have to be committed to a process, all right, which is the things that you have to do to be successful at whatever that vision is. It can be something as simple as, I want to lose 20 pounds. Well, it's easy to find a defined process of what you have to do to do that. It's not difficult to find. But the third thing, and the, the thing that most people struggle with most, is you have to have the discipline to execute day in and day out. Most people have a vision. They can define what it takes to accomplish the vision, but can they execute it? Do they have the di discipline to make the right decisions? And what is discipline? and what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it, the way it's supposed to get done. But more specifically for all of us, and I think what I use with the players so that they can relate to it, is I have this little thing over here that I know I'm supposed to do, but I really don't want to do it. Can you make yourself do it? Then I have this little thing over here that I know I'm not supposed to do, but I want to do it. Can you keep yourself from doing it? Now these decisions we can relate to all of us because we probably make a hundred of those every day. And those choices and decisions certainly determine whether we can stay committed to a process that's going to help us accomplish the vision that we have. So your mindset is very, very important. And once you can do all those things, can you stay focused on the process or will you get overcome by the circumstances? Can you stay focused on the vision or will you get overcome by the circumstances? Maybe you've seen it, I hope you have, but a few years ago when Chuck Pagano, the coach of the Indianapolis Colts, who's a good friend of mine, got diagnosed with cancer, actually couldn't coach during the season. Uh, the team went on and got in the playoffs and he did the locker room speech uh, where he talked about vision and circumstance. And he says, my vision is, is that I can see my daughters grow up and I can dance at their wedding. My circumstance is I have cancer. I think that's the greatest example of what I'm talking about. Now we go out to practice and we're playing for a championship and it's cold outside and all anybody can focus on is the circumstance of the weather. This is what I'm talking about, simple things. Can you stay focused on the things that are gonna help you accomplish what you wanna do? And to me, that is the most difficult thing to get young people, especially, to do today. And then what about getting people to work together, together? You know, you really have to have, and I learned this from Bill Belichick, you really have to define exactly what the expectation is of everybody in your organization and everybody on your team and what the standard is. Because if you don't do that, people don't know exactly what's expected of them. But once it is defined, you have to hold everybody accountable to that because mediocre people don't like high achievers and high achievers don't like mediocre people. And if you let those things coexist in your organization, you're never going to have any kind of team chemistry. And it takes a lot of leadership. And you know, what is leadership? First of all, be someone that somebody wants to emulate. Set a good example. And you cannot be a good leader if you don't care about other people because you have to be willing to listen. And just listen for three things. And I say feel, felt, found. I know how you feel. I felt that way before. Here's what I found out. If you just do that for somebody, you will help them so much. And to serve someone else, you have to care. 
And you can't be a good leader if you're not willing to serve other people. And you know, a good way to just take a little inventory of this, and I always say this, is how do you pray? Do you pray to be blessed? Or do you pray to be a blessing? You know, someone else has to bless you. You can be a blessing every day in everything that you do, but it's really going to be about serving other people. That really makes you special. In resiliency, Blake Sims. You know, Blake Sims is a fifth-year senior. He's an African-American quarterback at the University of Alabama. No one ever thought he could play quarterback for Alabama. He got moved to running back. He ran the scout team for four years. Scout team. Scout team quarterback, scout team running back. Only did he get to be the second team quarterback last year when the second team quarterback decided to transfer because he didn't think he was going to play. This guy worked so hard to overcome adversity. After we had the spring game this year, I had a 10-year-old kid come up to me and say, Coach, if Blake Sims is our quarterback, we will not win a game next year. True. Made me scratch my head a little bit. But now we're talking about a guy that's led his team to the SEC championship, just got voted by his teammates, and it wasn't even a close margin, the most inspirational player on his team. And because of his inability to pass the ball effectively, that's why nobody thought he'd ever be the quarterback at the University of Alabama. He just broke every single season passing record in the history of the school. And he led an offense that got gained the most yards of any offensive team in the history of Alabama football. This is for a guy that no one thought could play. The 10-year-old didn't think could win a game because the guy worked and overcame every deficiency that he had in a way that I've never seen over a five-year period. And I think it's a tremendous sort of lesson for all of us, all right, that that vision I talked about, that process that I talked about, the discipline, staying focused on your vision rather than the circumstance that you're in, this is a great example of all of that. Hmm. Wow. And you wonder why Nick Saban is the best coach in football, college football history. If that, if that didn't get you a little bit emotional, you probably were not tuned in, right? You may be Blake Sims. You may feel like you've been running a practice team. You may feel like you need the mindset, that you lacked the discipline, but it's just a choice to focus on the process, not the circumstances, right? What is the standard for your team? I mean, I'm getting chill bumps. What is the standard for your team? What do you expect? What do you accept? High achievers don't like mediocre people. Right. If, if you want to build a team of high achievers, the reason that you look at the culture of different teams, Team New Vision and others, right, is that they're attracting high achievers because they know that's what it takes to win. Guys, I'm going to close with this. If you believe in yourself and have dedication and pride and never quit, you'll be a winner. The price of victory is high, but so are the rewards. So I don't wish that this journey is easy for you. I just wish that you stay on the path to develop the skills necessary to win because a smooth sea never created a skilled sailor. And often it's the adversities that we face that help us become the people that we need to be. Mr. Scanlon, I appreciate you, sir. I hope today was good for everybody and I'll turn it back over to you.